This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey everyone, welcome to On the Market. We have an excellent show today to talk about one of the most up and coming, most exciting new strategies in real estate known as midterm rentals. And for this interview, I am joined by Kathy Fecky. Kathy, how are you? Great. So happy to be here. This is a a really interesting topic that I think a lot of people will want to learn about. Yes. it's It's an amazing interview, which we'll get to in just a moment. But I want to know about your weekend furnishing your short-term rental. Kathy sent a text to the On The Market team um, showing a giant shopping cart full of all sorts of stuff. What were you up to? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, we have a development in Park City that our company, uh, you know, uh, syndicated. And uh, Rich and I bought one of the townhomes early on. So we got an amazing deal. Um, Finally, it closed and, and we've been furnishing it. And it was such a pain. <laughs> so, um, and after our last show, you and I talked about, hey, if we would all just stop spending money just for a month, then maybe inflation would go down. And then I send a picture of me with this huge shopping cart with all the things, <laughs> um, all the things. And so I just thought, wouldn't it be nice if someone would just do this for me? I had hired my property manager to do it for me, but uh, it just was taking too long and too slow. And anyway, to to have this interview today. Just just after uh, I, I spent hours, days trying to furnish this thing or finish the furnishing. Like the property manager did a lot of it, but not the final touches. And of course, you want to come out of the gate strong, right? You don't want your first review to be bad. <laughs> so um, I just thought well, it would be really great to automate. And that's something you can really learn from this interview is how do you automate the stuff to make it easier? So you can travel the world like they do. And if you're curious who they are, it's Zayana McIntyre and Sierra Weaver, who wrote the new book for Bigger Pockets, 30 Day Stay. And we'll get all into that in just a moment. But yeah, I think Kathy and I both had our minds blown talking about the automation of furnishing. I've only done it once. I shared the story, but it is it's hard. It is not easy. It's something I completely underestimated when I was first doing it. And it is extremely time consuming. And it's amazing to hear how Zayana and, and Sarah have created this lifestyle for themselves that is like really pretty automated um, and sounds like it's only going up from here. Like it sounds like the growth of this, this niche um, could be just at the beginning. We could, could see a lot more growth in, in the next couple of years. Yeah. And how they automated the management of it too, because in short term rentals, the, the management fees are really, really high. If you use a manager, they can take 20, 25%. Oh, that's a big old chunk. Oh, they could take 40%. Oh, man. I, I told a couple of places that do 40. It's insane. Yeah. So to just that alone, to be able to automate like they do uh, with, with you know, I don't know how they do. I don't know exactly how they do it. I'm going to read the book again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to hire them as a consultant, which they said they would do for me. So yay. <laughs> Well, I learned during the course of the interview that Kathy wrote the forward for this book. So I think they, uh, you, you get some free consulting uh, in exchange for that. Perfect. Well, with that, let's, let's not waste any more time. Let's bring on Ziona and Sarah to talk about midterm rentals. Sarah Weaver and Ziona McIntyre, welcome to On the Market. Ziona, how are you doing? So good. Thanks for having us. It's very exciting. Sarah, how have you been? Yeah, really good. Still recovering from BPCon and excited to be here. Well, and recovering from being in Thailand, right? (laughs) Yeah, I'm in the future, (laughs) 12 (laughs) hours ahead. I think this is the most global podcast we've done we have three continents represented we have sarah's in uh in asia i'm in europe and we have everyone else in the u.s pretty cool amazing all right well both of you are here because you are the newest entrance into the bigger pockets authors club congratulations on your book uh can you tell us a little bit about it sarah yeah absolutely it's called 30 day stay a real estate investor's guide to mastering the medium term rental and what about what how did you decide to write this book yeah ziana and i met um virtually like you do most of your real estate investor friends and we realized we had two things in common we love to travel and we both owned furnished rentals and after uh 
few shared Ubers and a shared hotel at a conference, we kind of came up with the idea to pitch a book to Bigger Pockets. And here we are exactly a year later with our book not only written, but in the hands of investors. Wow, that's amazing. That took 20, one fifth of the time it took me to write my book. So, well, congratulations. <laughs> we were on the fast track for sure. That's awesome. Well, Zeronia, I, I know you, you've been in the short-term rental market for a while. Was this, how did you start getting into medium-term rentals? It really happened for me in COVID. So before then, of course, I'd had some longer requests and longer guests, but it wasn't until that kind of like time in March that was really intense for a lot of short-term rental hosts. I don't know if either of you were hosting then, but, um, it just happened that one day to the next, all of the reservations canceled. And so it seemed like it was fine and we were ramping up for a great summer again. And then everybody freaked out around COVID. So it was like early March. And then I had to kind of collect myself and pivot and say like, well, I'm financially independent if these places are rented, but if they don't rent, like <laughs> I got to figure something out here, you know? So, um, Luckily, I saw bookings coming in that were longer, like people started to come as relief workers and people needed more space for um, homeschooling their kids and working from home. And so it started to naturally happen. And I had a lot of places out of state. And so I was like, man, the biggest hurdle for me is how am I going to show these properties? Um, but luckily, I realized pretty quickly that a lot of these people are booking sight unseen, just like a short term rental. And so I was able to really pivot and adapt and figure out everything online. It took a little bit of iterating. What's the difference between the guests? I mean, obviously with a medium term rent medium term rental, they're not necessarily travelers or are they? Well, it kind of depends. Um, I can also let Sarah answer this, but... Um, and by that, I mean vacation, va vacationers. I mean, obviously, yeah. it's traveling people, but... Yeah, so the typical short-term rental in my experience was like three or four nights. Mm -hmm. um, and these are more like three months, but I've seen a lot of digital nomads do one month. So especially at the beginning, people were like, I'm going to go to Denver and then Austin and then New Orleans, you know? Um, and so they would just hop around like that. So I've definitely had one month stays, but travel nurses are also a big part of our tenant pool and they're three months, generally three to six months. Um, Sarah, do you want to mention, I know you've had like renovations and we've both had people from insurance claims. So yeah. What other tenants are you seeing? Yeah. I think one of the things we want all of the listeners to understand is that it's not just traveling nurses. Like the title of the book could have been traveling nurses if that was the only people that we served. Um, but we really like medium term rentals can serve all different types of populations. So I have a friend, she has a duplex in South Kansas City. She has been a hundred percent occupied, um, had even a couple turnovers in there where it was same day turnovers, and she's never housed a nurse. I have another friend who has rentals or medium term rentals in Waco, and she is renting to construction workers who are working on a job site for 60 to 90 days. I've housed a divorcee who just messaged and was like, can I move in tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so we have people from all different walks of life renting from us, not just traveling nurses. And Sarah, were you, were you, did you get into medium term rentals in, in the same way or had you been doing it prior to COVID? Actually, my first furnished rental was a medium term rental. And so I posted my own unit that I was living in on Airbnb. And in my mind, I was like, oh, it'll get rented on the weekends and then I'll just go travel or go visit my grandparents. And my very first booking was for 30 days. And so I became homeless overnight. <laughs> and for a normal person, that would be a problem. For me, I was like, woohoo, I'm going to Mexico. So, <laughs> so that's what I did. And so I actually got into medium term right away. And then I do what's called the hybrid model. So my units are in markets that still allow short term rentals, meaning municipalities don't limit the, the nights of stay. So I will switch it to a short term rental in the summer and kind of monopolize or utilize those shorter term stays to net more money. But then I noticed a trend come September, October, no one's going to Omaha on a Wednesday night. <laughs> and so I switched from short term to medium term to keep my occupancy rates high. 
Well, that begs the question, why are people vacationing in Omaha during the summer? Or are they? <laughs> I had the same question, and I now own, I own eight units in Omaha, and I was scratching my head too. So what I have is in the summer, there's the College World Series. So I can make an entire mortgage payment just by renting a couple of days in June for the College World Series. Then a really interesting trend is that people use Omaha as a stopover on their road trip from Chicago to Denver. Hmm. And at first I was like, oh, that's so interesting. I like, I was like, that makes sense. And, you know, I allow pets so they might bring their dog and they prefer to stay in an Airbnb over a hotel. But then it was great. I would have repeat guests. So they loved my place so much that then they'd stay on the way back as well. And then this summer, I had even more repeat guests where they did that last summer. It worked out really well, so they did it again this summer. And so those are great because they're staying on like a Tuesday or a Wednesday, which really helps with my occupancy rates. I had no idea that was like a common travel pipeline, the (laughs) Chicago to Denver road trip. Yeah, I at least house, I think, 10 people like that over the summer. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. And they would stay in a in your home versus a hotel because of because you allow pets or are there other reasons why obviously your competition is is the hotel. Yeah, it's really interesting especially when we're talking about medium term rentals. Like if someone's going to stay for a month, they would prefer to stay in what's in a home. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing a lot more families utilize medium term rentals in the summer. Um, maybe one of the parents typically is bound to their job during the summer. But because of COVID, they now have the ability to be untethered and and work remotely. And so we're seeing more and more families utilize houses in the summer, even as medium term rentals to get away from the city or just change location, because now one of the parents can work remotely or both of them can work remotely. So as the title of the book suggests is that I assume the cutoff between like definition between short term rental and medium term is 30 days. Is that sort of the. okay? so I'm curious, uh, Zayona, what what about like market conditions? You said you started in in COVID. Like what makes you think medium term rentals are going to maintain this demand going forward? Yeah, there's a few things. So first, just the ability to work from home grew tremendously. And I know some places are bringing people back to work, but I think there's just been a change in the culture. And a lot of people are specifically looking for jobs that are location independent, and they might be joining their partners on travels. So we, we see a lot of traveling nurses that now bring their partner or their child along with them. Um, so we're kind of seeing that trend some more. And then, yeah, just a lot of people working from home. So often I'm seeing people wanting like two bedrooms so they can each kind of have an office during the day um, and then go explore, you know, on their off hours. And I do this with my partner, too. Sarah also does this. She lives in Airbnbs full time. Um, so that is also just a bigger trend. We see that a lot in the financial independence community. A lot of people just go from Airbnb to Airbnb and don't actually have a home. So what I, what we saw with COVID is that there are now 11 million digital nomads. And for those of you that don't know what a digital nomad is, it just means that they work likely for themselves or for a company and they can live anywhere. And so that number was 7% of the workforce before COVID, and then it jumped to 42%. And so those are significant numbers. They're not all our our tenants, for example. Like, I don't just house digital nomads, but it's becoming more and more. So much so that 24% of Airbnb bookings were for 28 days or more this year. So I I guess the, the, the question then is, with medium term rentals, does it sort of fall in terms of revenue per night? Is it less than short term rentals, but more than a traditional buy and hold long, you know, like year long lease? So this is interesting because this kind of changed for me recently. But what I used to tell people is that there's market rate. I find medium term to be like one and a half times and then short term to be twice market rate, just as a very loose general rule. Um, but we, I found this guy just a couple nights ago that is doing, um, 
contact contracts directly with nurse placement and with insurance companies. And although I've had some of those bookings, I just don't necessarily go after them directly. But he's saying that there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get um, the short term rental rate of two times, even in your medium term rental. And so that's Jesse Vaz- Vazquez, Vasquez. I think it's Vasquez. Um, if you guys want to look him up on YouTube, he's just kind of getting started, but it seems like he has programs for going after them specifically and building those connections. So I'm definitely going to try to learn that because that'll bring up my revenue, which is already fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so what markets does the strategy work in? It seems cheeky to say, but every market. So I'm seeing medium term rental work in small town Iowa, in outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, I own a few in the Midwest. Ziana owns some in Colorado, in places where she couldn't do short term rental. And so it's really nice to be able to utilize this in markets that restrict short term rentals, but then also in markets that you wouldn't necessarily think to own a short term rental like Omaha, Nebraska. And how are you managing them when they're out of state? Are, do you use a regular property manager or are you still using services like Airbnb? We both self-manage. So both of us started out self-managing ourselves to keep costs down and, and really hit that financial independence number as quickly as possible. Then both Ziana and I now have what I call in-house property management. So I have a virtual assistant and an executive assistant helping manage these. And n- neither of them are in the locations that my medium term rentals are either. Same for you, Ziana. I yeah. mean, wh- what about the cleaning and the, the, the things that a property manager would normally do? Yeah. So even when I was teaching people about short term rentals, I said that you could start with a really bare bones team. Like once you have the property, all you need is a cleaner and a handyman and you're off to the races. So it doesn't have to be super complicated. And most of those contacts you can get from your agent. So if you've got a good investor friendly agent in that market, they usually have a list of contractors and different people to reach out to. And yeah, from there, you know, we have taken on assistance and that really helps. But for a long time, we were just doing it ourselves. It's actually um, pretty management light because you're only needing, you know, potentially four tenants a year. It sounds like a lot if you're coming from long-term rentals, but from short-term rentals, it's like, ooh, walk in the park. And uh, I know when we were at BPCon, I was I was asking about uh, just what types of property. And it was it was pretty exciting that it could be not what would be normally a long-term rental. So you can go after properties that maybe other people aren't looking at. So yeah, Sarah, tell me about that. Yeah, all of my units are 1-1 one, one, or 2-1 units. And so what normally might not be as attractive to a long-term uh, buy and hold investor, I can go ahead and swoop in because it's exactly what I want. Yeah. And I'll say that like I have a bunch of well, not a bunch, but I have a few condos. And so that's usually like the lowest on the totem pole for investors. They don't want to touch an HOA. They don't like condos. A one bedroom, no way. So those I love because actually they're being looked over. And I feel like that's the important thing as an investor is like, how can you make something that is overlooked something really valuable? And so the condos that I actually love are ones that you know, one bedroom that have shared utilities in the building. So those might be like a shared boiler, shared water heater. So you don't have to have a furnace and a water heater in your unit. Um, and then even ones with shared laundry, because the longer term stays, they're fine. They're, you know, they're not living there forever. So they're like, oh, cool. I'll just, you know, as long as there's laundry in the building, they're fine with that. And so in my unit, there's almost no maintenance because all I have is like a fridge and a dishwasher and a, an oven. So there's almost nothing that can go wrong. I, I was going to ask that because yeah, I, I own just one short term rental, but just owning one is enough to know that you get some ridiculous uh, tenant stories or guest stories, I guess you could say, um, how, how the houses get a little uh, abused. Do you find that the wear and tear on properties is similar with midterm rentals? I find that it's actually less. And so you have you have these tenants who really take like a sense of ownership with the unit. Um, also, because they're there for three months, like if they do break something, they're going to tell you. And so that allows me to like replace something even while that tenant is in the unit, which is less stress at time of turnover. Whereas when you have a short-term rental and you have turnover every two to three days 
and then someone's checking in that same day, it creates a lot of stress in my opinion. And then to compare it to long-term rentals, what I find is that my long-term rentals, they move out and they've been living there for a year. They haven't told me anything that's wrong with the property. So then when I do finally do a walkthrough, it's like how on earth are there scuffs on the ceiling or like silly string on the wall. And then you have to clean that and paint that and Mm -hmm. maybe even redo flooring. And so it creates a lot of headache. But my units, I I own nine medium-term rentals now. And I can tell you maybe two stories where it was like when we went in, there was a bad surprise. But with all of the turnover that we've had, it's usually really simple. Yeah, it seems like a very different type of... um occupant or tenant. The short-term rental is definitely going to be more of a party in most cases. Well, and sometimes these nurses, they're so tired after a long shift that they're not even using the unit at all. And so I had a cleaner who messaged me and the tenant had been there for three months. And the cleaner's like, I don't even think she touched a dish. Like nothing in the kitchen looked like it had been used. All right. I want to talk about, uh, a subject that I, I've been very interested in recently, which is the regulation of short-term rentals uh, that seems to be becoming more and more common across the U.S., particularly in big cities. Do you think that, one, I'm just curious about your opinion about that, um, and do you think that trend is going to continue? And if so, could that increase demand or and maybe supply, like could more short-term rental people start getting into midterm rentals? Um, Zayona, I'm curious what you think. Yeah. I mean, I do think that trend is continuing. It seems like most places have already outlawed it that are going to do it, but I still hear about, like it started with the cities and then it kind of leaks out, right? Because people are like, well, if it's illegal in the city, I'll just be right on the border, which I think is a great strategy. Um So they're starting to say, like, oh, no, now it's the county or this or that. So that is still changing. I see that a lot in Colorado where I live. So that, I think, will continue. I also think that there's just a trend now towards more urban markets, just the way that things are happening with a recession happening or on the rise. Um, It just seems like people are scaling back on their travel. So first, they're not going to do plane travel, so they might cut out Hawaii and, you know, Mexico or something. And then I think it moves towards the vacation rental markets where they're like, let's just drive. We're going to drive to Orlando or we're going to go to the beach. Um, And then later, as they get a little more scared, which I've been kind of seeing lately, people are saying, I'm just going to do necessary travel. We have to see our family in Omaha. We're going to go there. You know, so that ends up being more urban. And I just feel like that's a little bit safer than buying in these markets where, they may stay vacation rental friendly, but they um, don't allow you to pivot your strategy. So if you're in a place where, um, I mean, like for for example, the Smoky Mountains, it's like people that live there and work in the restaurants or cleaning ladies, they're not going to rent out your place for $5,000 a month, which is like what people's mortgages tend to be. So I feel more worried about buying something without a, like a backup plan, right? Yeah, it just seems like there's not as much competition for it, uh, whereas there is with STRs. Uh, that's been one of the issues I've seen and that you know Airbnb came out with saying that, yes, there's actually more people using short-term rentals, but um, hosts are actually making less because there's so many more units available. But that would you say that's the case with medium-term rentals too? There, there's more and more people getting into it? Well, it's really interesting. I I love talking about the competition because if you're a listener thinking about turning one of your units into a medium-term rental, what I encourage you to do is go to a website called furnishfinder.com and look as if you're a renter, like you're going to rent a place, and you'll really quickly see that the units are, I don't have a nice way to say this, they're just not as aesthetically pleasing Whereas there's a lot of beautiful listings on Airbnb. And so competition is so much higher on Airbnb for short-term rentals. Whereas Furnish Finder, which is where I find most of my tenants, I don't have any competition in Omaha. Um, Come at me, you guys. No, <laughs> but but what I but what I find is that I've I've had tenants actually say that. So I had a tenant who was willing to live in a hotel for two and a half weeks 
waiting for my unit to come available. And so the first thing I asked as an investor was, oh my gosh, are there no other units? Meanwhile, I'm texting my agent like, must buy more MTRs. And she said, no, 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 there are other units available, but they're all granny units. Like none of them are cute like yours. I've been a traveling nurse for two years and I'm just sick of living in ugly places. And so when I saw your unit, I'm willing to wait for it to come available. So how does um, Furnish Finder work? Do you just list your property there? And is that the main site that you use? That's a great question, Kathy, because at BPCon, I realize people don't know how to use Furnish Finder. So I'm like <laughs> trying to get the word out. Yeah. Um, so the difference between Furnish Finder and a, and a website like Airbnb is that Airbnb is a booking platform. So people actually go on there and they, they book your place through the platform and they market it through there. Um, with Furnish Finder, it's more of like a lead generation platform. And so what they're doing is they're capturing people's information and then they just give you a list of t- potential tenants. And then from there, you it's kind of your job to reach out to these people. And so they can reach out to you, but you're not going to see many requests coming through. There's just like a lot happening. But if you reach out to people and are proactive, you can have just a you know copy paste template that's really easy and just blast that out when you're doing um your tenant searches, but it's not that labor intensive because you're only looking for tenants maybe a couple of times a year. It could be twice a year. It could be three times a year, right? So um, I find that that just makes it a little bit easier. Sounds like an opportunity for someone to create an app, bigger pockets <laughs> for medium term rentals. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get right on that. <laughs> I'm curious, it's sort of along, uh, along the line of Kathy's question. Um, you know, in the short term rental market, there have been some companies that have sprung up with data about demand and pricing and uh, like AirDNA or so, there's some other ones. Does that exist for medium term? It does. That same website, Furnish Finder, if you go to furnishfinder.com forward slash stats, that's where a lot of the data we're using, um, we get. And it was fun. I actually was using it just this morning before this podcast because I had a consultation with an investor outside of Salt Lake City. And her area, um, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the market, so now everyone's going to go there, but it's Ogden, so it's just north of Salt Lake City. There were only four listings that rent the entire unit. Whereas the other, I think it was eight listings are all only like a room in someone's house. And so that's, that's a concept we haven't really touched on is that you can rent a portion of your house to a medium term tenant as well. And that's obviously really common. It's more common in Ogden, for example, there were more listings where you just rent the room than the entire unit. Wow. Yeah, this is pretty cool. I'm looking at it right now. It seems like uh, if you are curious about this, you can go on furnishfinder.com slash stats. We'll throw a link to that. Um, and you can type in a city and get some uh, information here. Obviously, can't look at all of this, but it does seem like there's some some really good ways that you can start measuring demand and seeing uh, where there might be opportunities for you. So Sarah, on your Facebook page, I, I saw you were showing one of your latest renovations and how what you do for decorations that attracts nurses and has them want to come back and stay and tell their friends, which I imagine is a thing. There might be some referral um, in there. So what are what are the kinds of furnishings that you want to put in your rentals to make it cozy? Yeah, absolutely. It sounds silly, but I have always have a $250 coffee table book budget. Um, they are aesthetically pleasing. They photograph well. They're easy to clean. They're not going to break. <laughs> and so I always recommend coffee table books. You want to create like texture and depth in your photos. And so that's a really easy, cheap, beautiful way to make your listing pop. And then the others throw pillows. So so many times I see a couch that has either no pillows or they're just a like solid color, no texture. That's a really inexpensive way to do that. I prefer ones where you can take the cover off and wash them um, in between guests. But those are two of the most like inexpensive ways to do it. Um, Some staples that you have to have in a medium term rental are blackout curtains in the bedroom. And then I really like using rugs. So I go to a store called At Home and they actually have washable rugs for under $300. And so that really like brings a room together. And then I beg everyone, please go bigger when you're buying rugs. I can't tell you how many listings I see that have like a little three by five 
in a like 15 foot living room. And I'm like, oh man, why a bigger rug. <laughs> people are so afraid to buy bigger rugs. But those are some quick tips. <laughs> That's a really good point. I, I know Rich and I looked up, um, you know, how you, you can actually look up online how, what your rug should look like to really um, make the room look bigger or its own space. And there's rules around that. So yeah, follow the rules. Um, Ziana, how about you? How much do you generally spend on the furnishings? Oh, well, that really depends on the size of the unit, right? So I did a unit recently that was two bedrooms and spent about 8000 And that was also paying the two two helpers that built all the furniture and put it all together. Um, so it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. I'd say, again, I don't like rules of thumb because it really depends, but you can probably get a, like a one bedroom unit for about 5,000 if you're doing it yourself and it's all new. And then each bedroom after that might be an additional 2,000. And then, yeah, there are companies, uh, Sarah offers us that will do the furnishing for you. So they'll either on their highest tier fly out there on a lower tier, they might just give you a furnishing list and in the middle, maybe they'll design the room specifically, but then you have to put it all together. Where on earth do you shop that you can get prices like that? Cause I just, I need to read the book a second time. <laughs> Um, so mostly let's see what we do. We do a lot of Wayfair, Amazon, Target, and then we love home goods. So, so, um, Amy Levine is on my real estate team and she furnishes all the medium term rentals in my market. Um, and so we go together and do, she does all my units and yeah, we love going to home goods. And on Wayfair, there's a section that's more like commercial use furniture. Do you use that? Or just regular stuff? I don't know that we have, but honestly, Amy picks everything out and then my assistant orders it. So I just like show up and it's there, you know, so <laughs> I, I can't claim to be like that cool. Because <laughs> you're in Hawaii or in Thailand. You don't have time to be furnishing. I got it is a lot to learn from you too. I know. Let me tell you a little story. So the last place that I bought was in Denver. And the reason I bought it is because I had this 1031 exchange that didn't happen. And I, I had had it all planned out. I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this place. It's going to be great. And I have all this time. And then I we ended up buying the place without using the 1031 exchange and then had to find a place fast. And it was just bad timing. And so the place I found was in Denver. It was like two days before my exchange expired. And I was like, oh my God. So I was like, we picked Denver because it's close to home. I could just go there and physically furnish it. It's going to be so easy. Well, I didn't think, but like, actually, I was going to be in Europe when I was closing on that place. So I, was like, <laughs> uh, so I had I had two of my helpers go do everything and it turned out beautifully. I still haven't seen it furnished. Oh, actually, I did once. But um, yeah, it's just one of those things where I don't really know where I'm going to be. And I, I have helpers for that. And do you just give the helpers a budget and they just pick out stuff or do they send you? Say, I'm saying this because I just went through it and it was not fun for me at all to do from a distance. Yeah. Well, Kathy, you know, <laughs> if you pre-order our book, it comes with a furnishing spreadsheet, you know, and so that's a that's a great guide. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, furnishing spreadsheets, I think, are they're like a general rule. And then you have to kind of think, what is the style? What's the age of my place? What is it kind of asking for? And then you customize some of the things. So we're always changing things a little bit. But yeah, I'm mean, happy to help you the next time you want to do something. Good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's really how my company came about is people saw that I furnished a place in Nebraska while I was living in New Zealand. And messages started coming in saying, oh my God, can you do mine? And <laughs> at first I was like, no, <laughs> because I'm busy. I got other businesses. And then the entrepreneur in me was like, wait a minute, this smells like an opportunity. And so that's how Aria Design Services was born. And now just this year alone, we've done 27 units in 11 states. And so please tell everyone how terrible it is to furnish your own unit so that I can get more people using our services. <laughs> oh, that's that's a great that's a great offer. Yeah, that's a great service. Yeah, having done a short term rental myself furnishing, it's absolutely miserable, especially if you don't know what you're doing, which I definitely did not know what I was doing getting into he's like he's like texting someone like okay don't let sarah see my three by five rug <laughs> <laughs> no i did i was smart enough to hire an interior designer i i i am horrible at design but then i went and 
picked up literally 183 boxes from Ikea. Uh, that was one of three three runs and did it all myself and tricked my friends into helping me. It was absolutely miserable. And then putting all that stuff together. Did you guys oh, do that? Oh, no. I did a, I did a, 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 build, a build your own bed party. I invited my friends, but there were no beds so they could come stay at the house because it's a cool house, um, but didn't tell them that there was no bed. So then when they got there, they had to build their own bed so oh, they had a place brilliant. to sleep. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> but seriously, that's how you have to do it. You have to trick people into helping you. Or read their book. <laughs> yeah, or, or do it the professional way. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. No, I have some things on the furnished list that like, they look great. It's it's like within my budget, but putting it together will make you want to like throw the nightstand out the window. And so I never will buy that nightstand again. And so you can rest assured that like everything I buy, I have put together myself. And I'm, I'm not saying putting it together is fun, but there are things that like never again will I buy that <laughs> nightstand. <laughs> Is Yana, how do you find people that d- they'll just put the stuff together for you and they like that? They that's their thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it I, I pay my kids to do it, but <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, so Amy is a machine. So Amy Levine that I work with here, it's crazy. You give her a drill and she just like puts stuff together in moments. So I am really bad at that. Like I am just not. I'm like, I will unpack the boxes. I will put things where they live. But I'm not going to, like, build anything. And I've seen her really upset around a credenza. It always seems like the credenza brings people down. Um, But now... Yeah, I've had a few different assistants that help me with it. I have like my showing assistant. She loves to build furniture, so that's good. Sometimes you bring in a handyman, but I'd say TaskRabbit. If you're just kind of like in a new market and you don't know people, TaskRabbit's a great option. Just have them build everything at once and then like help you move it around. Well, I just think we have to find out where the best place you both have gone to visit while you're making all this money from your medium-term rentals. Good question. (laughs) That is a good question. Um, do so you have one, Sarah? I, I have to yeah. think. Yeah, I keep, I keep going, I keep going back to Antigua, Guatemala. Um, I, it's great as a digital nomad because it's central time zone. So the time zone's a lot easier than Asia. The price is amazing. Like I can live like a queen for $1,100 a month and the flights there, like you can fly direct Miami, Houston or LA for like $79. Wow. And so Antigua, Guatemala has like become my second home or home away from being homeless. <laughs> Sounds amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I spend a lot of time in Europe and Hawaii because that's where my partner's from Europe. I'm from Hawaii, so we kind of go both of those places a lot. But for ease of time zone, going down to Mexico, I like doing that a lot. So Sayulita is a fun place. Mm. I like that there's surf and then also there's a lot of yoga and healthy food and things like that. So yeah, I love Sayulita. Yeah. Okay, I, I am I am not a fan. So I went I went to Sayulita with Soli. Uh, I think you guys just had her on the podcast Lattes and Lisas, and we both got a parasite. Oh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and so and so it's funny how as a traveler, some places are like, yeah, that's great. I'm so glad you love it. <laughs> I'm like here with clenched teeth, like never again will I go there. But obviously, it's not the entire town of Sayulita's fault that we got sick. <laughs> So before before we wrap up, you know, since the show is on the market, I need to ask you both a little bit about the housing market and how you're preparing or are you making any adjustments to your business based on sort of some of the shifts that we're seeing in the housing market? Um, Do you think, you know, medium term rentals are going to keep going up? Are you adjusting at all? Um, Curious to hear your thoughts, Sarah. Yeah, so I'm doing a mixture of two strategies. I'm doing out-of-state investing to keep prices lower and then using the medium-term rental strategy to keep rents high. I find that that's been the best way to battle inflation Um, Rather than have my money in a money market account or, God forbid, a checking account, I want to put as much money into real estate as possible. But then we have these higher interest rates. And so I find that with the increased cash flow and increased rental income that I'm getting from the medium term rental, it's one of the best ways to combat the higher interest rates. I am a believer, like I've seen a few trends now since I've been in real estate like 10 years, is that the rents are always lagging behind the mortgage prices. And so even though people are seeing softening in their markets, 
it's not necessarily that buying a home gets cheaper. It's just that the interest rates make it so expensive that actually the mortgage price that they're paying every month is still really high and still getting higher in some places. And so rents have to catch up with that. Of course, some places, you know, people have owned it for 10 years and they can charge a cheap rent, but for new investors coming in the market, they need to cover their mortgage. And so this idea that like, oh, I'm going to save money and be in a cheap rental forever, that that's not real. That's not going to happen. So for us, I, I see that there's a lot of demand, which helps low supply, and then rents are continuing to come up, and that's just really going to help us grow. And then, of course, if you can specialize and get these really high contracts from insurance agencies, that's going to be a huge bonus. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter experienced that with the California fires just by accident, where she had put her her home on the Airbnb, you know, the short-term rental Airbnb market. Uh, and then when the fires happened in Paradise, California, just the whole city burned down. She was getting calls from insurance companies saying, you know, please, this family will pay, will pay $3,500 a month when her rent had been, or, or her mortgage was 1200 So she experienced that first time, firsthand. Um, and then built that relationship with the insurance company. So when that family left, they had someone ready for her. So I, I can see how, you know, you want to get to know the insurance companies. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being here. This has been a pleasure and congratulations on the new book. Is there anything else, uh, Ziona, you think our audience should know about medium term rentals before you get out of here? I can't believe we didn't mention this, but Kathy wrote the foreword to our book. So that was like, especially what? why we had her here. So definitely go in and read that, guys. So if you guys pre-order our book now, and that is at biggerpockets.com slash pod 30, uh, I believe you can use any of our names for 10% off. You get a bunch of bonus content. So we did some cool behind the scenes interviews with other investors um, on furnishing, on whether you should turn your short term rental or long term rental into a medium term rental. We've got the furnishing list. We've got an analyzer tool. Um, and then there's going to be a webinar with Sarah and I um, in December for everybody who pre-ordered. And then the last thing is that one lucky person is going to win a one-on-one -on -one call with both Sarah and I. We both do um, consulting on our own. And so that'll be really fun. I'm excited about it because I don't know how she consults versus how I consult. So it's really just like Ooh. selfishly awesome. <laughs> you're get, so you both, both of you are going to be consulting with one Winner? I know their head's going to explode. Wow, it's going to be gonna crazy. Be very valuable. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's definitely worth. Uh, I mean, the book seems great, so you might as well uh, pre-order and get a chance to win that incredible additional value. Oh, well, thank you guys. We really appreciate it. Does Kathy get entered to win? She wrote the she wrote the forward. I mean, yeah. she should probably get entered. I mean, Kathy can call us anytime she wants. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, right. I, actually, for Kathy, I'll fly to Malibu and do all of our strategy sessions in person. Let's do that. Okay. That's what I said, too. I was like, hmm, let's make this a little more attractive. Kathy just has the trump card. Yeah, she's just, <laughs> just like, anyone will go consult for Kathy. You just go get to hang out in Malibu. It's amazing. Come on out, pick the date. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Sarah, what about you? Any any last thoughts on uh, medium-term rentals that our audience should know about? I think for, for investors out there that are like thinking, oh yeah, it sounds great, but, or I've always wanted to do that, but my biggest urge is to just try it. Like the best thing that I ever did in my 20s was just buy real estate. Like I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have community. I didn't have, you know, masterminds and coachings and mentors. I just went for it because that's my personality and it's the best thing I could have ever done. So like we joke about all the travel that we get to do, but my life is only possible because I chose to invest in real estate. And so if you're listening to this podcast and you want to own more rentals, you want more cash flow, I urge you don't wait, just do it. I second that. Yeah. Woo. Time. Time is what makes you wealthy. Yeah. You can make all the mistakes and it'll correct you over time. <laughs> That's a good way to put it for sure. Well, Sarah and Ziona, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Congratulations on the new book. I'm super excited. I'm going to come to that webinar for sure. Yeah, me too. I, uh, I sort of swore off active investing when I moved to Europe, but now you all are inspiring me. Maybe I need to get off my ass and start, start doing things directly again. Um, <laughs> 
Thank you for being here. Uh, and, and we'll uh, post all the information about the book in the show notes as well if you want to find a place to pre-order and get attached for all of that. And hopefully we'll have you on again soon. And uh, maybe next year we'll learn more about what you all are up to. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I guess I could ask you what you think, but now I know that you wrote the forward to this book. So I already know what you think. You think this is cool, right? <laughs> I think it's so cool. What Bigger Pockets brings to the table is just so much youthfulness, so much, so many new ideas, new techniques. And this is one of them that I had heard about. There's, There's been a few people out there talking about it and doing it. Uh, I just never really understood what kind of demand was out there for it. I knew traveling nurses, but how many are there? And and then we heard that that the number is increasing dramatically. In fact, they said there's almost more traveling nurses than full time. Uh, so that's this is just great information. I just I love all the fresh ideas that Bigger Pockets brings. Yeah, it's super cool, and I think that the work from home thing really will add significant demand there. Mm-hmm. You know, I there there is some a lot of chatter about work from home declining a little bit but if you look at the data it's pretty stable like it's staying where it was six months ago and you know if there's a recession and the labor market really changes that could make a difference but i'm guessing that we'll still keep pretty high elevated levels of work from home for a while and i think there's people it sounds pretty fun right like if you had a family and you could work remote and rent a lake house or something over the summer or go visit family instead of staying at a hotel. You know, it it is a really intriguing option um, for for people who don't, I guess, uh, location independent is the word I I did not know, but people who are location independent. Well, especially in this market, on today's market, where uh, the employer, the employee has the power, because there's just not enough employees out there for all the employers that want them. So I've I've heard that employees are making the demand. Yeah, I'll work for you, but on these conditions, I want <laughs> I want to be remote. I want to be independent. Uh, so it, it is it is a really exciting thing. We've been doing it at, at Real Wealth for oh, 12 years. We've been a remote company. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, because Rich and I wanted to live in Malibu, but we didn't want to have an office here and our place didn't want to move. So it just made sense that so we've been doing the whole Zoom thing and it was it started with go to meeting and so forth and using online systems like Basecamp. So yeah, we I just think more and more companies learned that, wow, you can really broaden your pool of potential employees if you can hire anyone from anywhere and not have to move them. So a lot of stodgy companies learned some new tricks over the last two years that they might really like. And then cutting back on office space, why would you not? You know, companies are going to want to cut their budgets. So yeah, I think I think the 30-day stay was a great book. I, I planned, I loved... Um, you know, writing the forward for it and getting to know them better. I'm going to read the book a second time. And uh, you and I, I think we have a competition now. We got to go do this. <laughs> One of us has to do it first. Yep. I know. I'm already thinking. Yep. I have some markets in mind. Good. Uh, maybe we'll go. We'll, we'll just, uh, maybe this will be, we've we've already all been talking about how on the market our cast needs to buy something together. Maybe it'll be a medium term rental. Yeah. Either we buy it together or even just looking at something maybe you own that's underperforming. No, that's true. I have a Cleveland property. That's a really nice property. It just never occurred to me. To, oh, that's a great idea. It's a decent income, but wouldn't it be nice to double it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. I really liked what Sarah is saying, because I guess in my head, I, I don't know a lot about midterm rentals, but I will read the book, um, is that I'm always just worried about the regulation, you know, because like right now it's like 30 days and I, I kind of just worry about like cities just moving the goalposts. Like if everyone's mm-hmm. like, okay, 30 days, then the city comes back, they're like, okay, it's 45. And it just like becomes this game. But I really like what she said about how doing this, even in markets where short term rentals are allowed, uh, because sort of like you're saying, re, re, uh, repurposing an existing property. Now that gives you three options. Like you could have mm-hmm. a short term rental, a medium term rental or a long term rental. It's a type of, you know, maximizing your exit strategies. We talk a lot about on bigger pockets. This is just like one more way you can make a lot of cash flow. Um, and and just sort of keep optimizing your your existing portfolio based on current market conditions. Yeah, and I don't really worry too much about the regulatory part of it because 
you just can't stop progress. You know, people want to and they don't want things to change. But look at Uber and all the pressure from, you know, from the taxi industry saying, you know, you can't be here. And they've kind of learned to coexist, you know, and and I think that's what we're going to see here. And, the, you know, 30 day has been pretty common, you know, the month to month lease is 30 days. So I don't know, I can't imagine they can mess with that too much. So it does seem like a a great option if you if you want that higher income from a furnished rental but don't want to deal with regulations on the short term. Yeah, for sure. It's really interesting. I think like in Arizona maybe the Supreme Court ruled that the regulations on short-term rentals went against the state's constitution. So I'm curious if like um like it could go that way too and open up more short-term rentals. But I think we're just sort of at this weird like pivot point now where regulations are coming. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're illegal. I don't know. Or maybe there'll be more of them. Um, But I I love that idea of just having a lot of optionality Uh, gives it makes it makes it pretty safe. All right. Well, thanks, Kathy. It's it was fun as always. I appreciate it. And obviously, uh, I should have known that you wrote the forward to this book, but it was fun to have someone who is so knowledgeable about this topic um, join for this episode. Thank you. It was fun. I love love being here. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please make sure to share it. If you think there's people you know who would be interested in medium-term rentals, send it along so they can hear about the book and learn from Zionia and Sarah directly. And with that, we will see you next time for On the Market. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media copywriting by Nate Weintraub, and a very special thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.